Hello and welcome back to another episode of What's On Your Mind. Uh, we had a, an episode just a week ago, so I'm going to leave the, uh, or forgo the opening commentary and leave that to my esteemed guest today. That is Edward Sheck and Anthony Iser. Guys, it's great to have you on the show. And uh, yeah, we'll get straight into things. Ed, do you want to kick things off today and tell us what's been on your mind? Yeah, sure. Uh, I've got one long idea for us, Sansom Farms, but just a bit of context as to how my portfolio has been working and the sort of how I've been trading. Now, as a lot of the growthier parts of the market continue to, to trade and trade very well with these stocks getting on higher and higher valuations, this last few weeks I've sort of unwound a few of the higher flying positions. So you'll remember Jason McDonald and Baidu, that's been a fantastic performer. And you'll remember a stock that I broke a while ago, Overstock, that stock sort of put in a 80% rally in the last month. So I'm happy to lighten up out of these positions, but my book's now getting quite short growth. So what I really want to do, because I'm a bit of an old shag, is I just can't keep chasing charts that have gone from the bottom left to the top right. So I'm finding it hard to buy stocks on 30 times sales and hoping someone's going to buy them off me at 35 times sales. So it's forced me into the less glamorous parts of the market. So I find myself in the world of chicken. Now, I'm not saying chicken isn't glamorous, but what I am saying is don't be short the US chicken. So we come on to Sanderson Farms. It's $3.1 billion market cap. It's just an integrated poultry company out of Mississippi. Big presence in southwest, southeastern states, bit up the eastern and western seaboards. Basically, it just rears, produces chicken, fresh chicken, frozen chicken, and it has a big, uh, a big presence in in home dining. Prepared chicken on a tray. That's it. Very straightforward KPIs. It also has an export business. Its primary export markets are Mexico. Uh, Middle East and Central and Southeast Asia. So we can get straight into the numbers. And if we look at the sales, we can see that sales only went up 3% last year during the COVID year. Sales are expected to grow 8% in 2021 and a further 5% in 2022. So that's steady, but far from spectacular top line growth. If we look at the second chart with earnings, you can see that it made a loss this year or last year of 41 cents. 2021 earnings will be $3.08 and 22 earnings will be $7.94. So when we're looking for earnings growth, obviously sequential earnings growth year on year, you've got to be very careful when we go through COVID that you're just not identifying the V, meaning 2019 was X, we've had a bad COVID, now earnings growth looks like it's really accelerating, but really we're just back to the previous year's number. So what I really like about this is that earnings growth trajectory is increasing in 2022. Now bear in mind that sales are only going up five or 7%. What does that tell us? It tells us that margins are expanding and there's really good operational efficiency. So just on the straight simplest numbers, we've identified a stock with really good earnings growth Margins are expanding, so that's good operational leverage. From a valuation perspective, the PE forward is 40. That's going to fall to 19.5 in 2022. And most interestingly, the peg ratio is less than one. And this is what I really like. So I'm trying to identify good earnings growth at a reasonable price. We can all go to the sexy parts of the market and see good earnings growth, but the price you're paying is high by any metric. That doesn't mean it's going to go higher, but I'm trying to pack my book now with reasonably priced growth. So when you look in the next chart, you'll see last quarter's numbers beat on the top and bottom line. So that earnings operation efficiency is starting to come through. I'm very, very pleased. When we look at the quick sector analysis, you'll see that Sanderson Farms has the highest earnings growth for 2021, doubled the earnings growth of the sector out to 2022 and it trades on the lowest price to sales at 0.8 times. So again, I like that. The PE multiple, as I said, is 40. So it is the highest rated, so I like that. Other factors to consider. The ISM data 
Obviously, food and agriculture have had a very expansionary second half of 2020. The sectors are still growing, although in November and December, the growth has come down quite a bit. This, I think, is very much a seasonal effect. So I'm pretty confident as we go through the first quarter and into Q2 earnings that the expansion will be back on track. Now, the company themselves are quite bullish on the in-home dining market and they're expanding and they're investing $160 million trying to maintain and grow their in-home dining market share. That's fine. The company is actually quite bearish on the reopening trade. Now, Sanson Farms obviously supplies the casual dining market. I'll come to this point later, but I really like the fact that the management are bearish on the reopening because I'm not. The only bearish thing I can find is obviously happening in the soft commodities. So feedstocks going up. So the USDA has recently downgraded the soybean crop in the States. There's concerns about the South American crop due to flooding. The long and the short of it is costs going to go up about $190 million for 2021. Total sales for this company just under $4 billion. There's a 4 or 5% increase in costs. That's already priced in, but I suspect risk is still to the upside in pricing. So we've gone through the numbers. We think we've identified cheap growth. We like everything about this. And the stock hasn't, it's at the top end of the range, but it hasn't really started to price in the earnings growth, in my opinion. I still have two further upside catalysts. Coming back to the point that management are bearish on the reopening trade, I love this because I'm actually more bullish. You know, if you look in the UK, 25% of the population is now vaccinated. Death rates have gone from 1,300 to 200, 300. Most of the at-risk people have been vaccinated. I think when we come through the next couple of months, come out of winter, death rates are low, suddenly the reopening will feel a lot more real and sustainable. So I love the fact that there's a chance that the Sunderson management may come out in between their earnings calls and say, actually, the pickup in casual dining is greater than we think. So I'm happy that their position at the moment is guiding the market down. The second catalyst is the export market. China's had a problem with its hog herd, the result of which is higher pork prices. That's led to substitution and they're just not exporting as much chicken to Southeast Asia. On the last earnings call, the management said that actually they mentioned two markets, Vietnam and Kazakhstan, and they just said that export demand is extremely strong. Prices are firm, and I think that trend will continue. There is also a problem in Europe with the bird, uh, with the chicken flocks. There's been a big problem with the avian flu. It hasn't had that much press, but France's chicken business has been hit quite hard. The Philippines have banned exports from Europe and chicken. And of course, Sanson's well placed with the Middle Eastern business. And of course, poultry prices are firm. So we've got two catalysts. The quants really stack up. Now we come to structuring. Next earnings dates the 25th of Feb. Now, Samson Farm, obviously not that glamorous, generally quite a low beta stock. So this would suggest I'd want more duration. So if this earnings is the 25th of Feb, to capture this next set of earnings, that would take you to May 25. So I really want to buy June. However, June options aren't listed. So it leaves me in a slight quandary. I do need to replenish some growth potential on my book. So I've decided to buy in May. Now, my price target's 190, 195 for this stock. I think the highest price target on the streets, 175. So I can either go for a straight vertical. So I can go out to May, buy the 150s, stocks at 150, by the way, sell the 190s. If you've got the smallest account possible for an options portfolio of 20 grand, that will give you a two grand net spend. You can buy two of the May 150s for $12.5. That will cost you two and a half grand. You can sell two of the May 190s for $2, raising a 400 credit. So you're in for just over two grand. Obviously, your cost is ten and a half dollars. The difference in your strikes is 40. So your absolute upside is twenty nine and a half dollars per lot. So you can get just under a three for one if the stock goes above or at 190 in May. The second option is to trade a calendar but we're going to sell a higher strike than what we buy. So the setup would be still buy two of the May 150s, but we're going to sell a March 165. 
that will still give you a net spend of 2,200. What we're saying is we're going to hit earnings. We want the stock to rally, but not above 165. Collect the March credit. Then, depending on the stock news and market conditions, we can reset, reset the hedge with April. Maybe the stock's at 163. We can sell the 175s. Hopefully, the stock rallies. Collect the credit. Then we can set up the May vertical. So the nice thing with these sort of extended calendar spreads is it gives us a little journey to go on, gives us a few chances to re-hedge, uh, and you can still get to a very decent over three to one ratio if the stock rallies slowly but steadily. And that's it. Don't be short the chicken. <laughs> I really like that, Ed. I think there was, uh, I think that was really concisely explained, and there's certainly a lot to to unpack in what you said there. I think. Um, yeah, for our viewers, a couple of takeaways would be uh, how you talked about it first in terms of the context of developing that idea, how it fits in your portfolio, given that you've already got higher price growth stocks. Let's say you wanted something that was uh, a bit lower price, but still growth. Um, and also another interesting point that I thought you covered or gave us insight into, certainly in the context of ITPM, is we get a lot of questions about looking at the value chain in terms of uh, you know, individual stocks. And you obviously looked at the supply side and the demand side of that stock. So I think, you know, our viewers will kind of really get some help from that. So that was, that was great, Ed. Thanks very much. Um, Anthony, over to you. Uh, have you got anything that you wanted to look at? Thanks, Chris. And hi, Ed. Um, yeah, I've got a, a similar sort of theme here. And they say great minds think alike. I'm happy just to be in the same ballpark as Ed. So the fact that we've both decided that um, the time's right to find, you know, growth, we still want growth, but as a, at a reasonable price. And so you sort of start venturing outside of um, some of the sectors and some of the names that have been uh, performing well. And I've come across uh, a company which I historically um, at one point was looking at, um, uh, at being short, and this is uh, PG&E Corp. Uh, which is a utility, $20 billion market cap. Uh, share price is currently about $11.76. It's on the west coast of the US and it is best known for starting all those terrible forest fires in California that uh, raged uh, during the summers of 2015 to 2018, uh, destroying huge amounts of property. Um, 80, 80 or more people uh, died as well. So you know, devastating um, and devastating for the company. They were facing $30 billion in compensation payments and uh, a long drawn out period um, of bankruptcy, bankruptcy protection. Uh, they worked through that process in the middle of last year, June, they exited um, that chapter 11 bankruptcy protection and I'll spare you all the details because the, you know, it's long and complicated and a huge amount of um, negotiation went into it. But the, the key points that you do need to know, uh, the day made and will continue to make you know, quite large uh, cash payments. Uh, Wildfire Victims Fund um, and Wildfire Victims Trust have been set up, funded with cash. They issued a huge amount of stock. Um, so the Wildfire Victims Trust is now a 24% shareholder um, of the company. Uh, the share count has gone from around 500 to uh, 500 million to around 2 billion uh, over the last two or three years as they've issued stock to uh, you know, either raise cash or issue stock directly to these uh, vehicles, uh, compensation vehicles. As I said, the market doesn't like uncertainty, but they've drawn a line under this now and we can sort of quite clearly sort of put to bed uh, these sort of past sins and work out, okay, what have we got left as a business? And what we've got left looks quite, quite good, really. Uh, so utilities 101, they're a re regulated asset. And essentially what happens is you take a number, this is your asset base, and your regulator, your government, in this case, California, says you can have X amount return on those assets. And then you try and operate those assets as efficiently as possible. And sometimes you can get an excess return. And then you can sort of negotiate from there um, for, for, for the next cycle. 
And so in this case, um, there's three reasons why I think uh, this new sort of clean slate uh, PG&E looks particularly interesting. First thing is for utility, um, the earnings are going to grow quite strongly. Um, we're looking at double digit um, compounding over the next four or five years for this company. And for a company that has been beaten up share price wise, beaten up valuation wise, uh, that's particularly attractive. And as that is bedded in and as the market becomes more comfortable with that, you'll see a significant re-rating um, to the sort of peer group level. Uh, that would imply a multiple that sort of double what it is currently. So plenty of upside from expansion, but we've got plenty of upside uh, from the earnings growth as well. So currently that regulated asset base is $44 billion and they're allowed to earn a 10.25% return on equity. So their core earnings for 2020 is around about $2 billion. It's non-GAAP numbers and we can't really do comparisons to previous periods. There's complexity here that's beyond uh, beyond this forum and beyond sort of most forums. It's, it's uh, very detailed um, restructuring that's gone on with the balance sheet. Um, the essence though is we're bottomed out now. So there's 2021 year coming up, EPS is going to be about a bucket share and that is the new base and from there we're going to be growing. And as I said, the, you know, the key issue and the key driver of earnings for a company like uh, PG&E that's a regulated utility is the size of this asset base. Uh, one of the key reasons why these fires started was that there wasn't, uh, you know, the, the asset bases weren't maintained well enough. There wasn't enough capital expenditure put into uh, uh, the, the transmission towers um, and reducing um, the likelihood of uh, forest fires around those. So we're going to see 8% compounded growth in that asset base. Um, so again, they can make a 10.25% return on this asset base, and this asset base is going to be growing by about $7 billion um, a year in terms of cap, in terms of capex uh, that they're spending, and the asset base growing by about 8% a year through to 2024. Um, that at the top line, through some cost savings um, and operational efficiencies, and Ed referred um, to Sanderson having those operational efficiencies and, and that operational leverage where uh, we can get increased sales on a, on a smaller cost base and see that margin expansion. Uh, we're going to see something similar here. So cost base, top, top line growing at 8%, um, 10 to 12% at the bottom line, which is a very strong growth rate for a utility. Uh, I feel very comfortable that they're going to be investing this money. Uh, the California government does not want um, a repeat of this uh, last few few summers and the fires that they've had. So they're going to be encouraging them to invest capex, uh, invest in their operations, and in return they're going to have to get um, a reasonable return from that. So if you have a look at this table here, um, you'll see uh, the next five years outlined and just what that rate base is on the top line. And then you can see um, some variance uh, and some, some, some changes in the numbers thrown, flowing through to the bottom line. These are all the complex um, agreements that they've made. They won't make an awful lot of sense to us when we're looking at them. You can see there that they're paying $330 million a year um, on an ongoing basis into the wildfire fund contribution. And yes, that's a negative, but the thing is we know what it is now and we've got certainty and clarity around those numbers. So we can put a line through it. We'd rather they weren't paying it. We'd rather there wasn't those forest fires, but there are, and now we know um, what, uh, what their obligations are. The second reason why uh, I think this company looks particularly interesting is there are quite a few catalysts uh, coming up. So as part of this transformation, they've got a new CEO, Patricia Pope, uh, and she's bringing on board a lot of programs um, in terms of cost reduction, a lot of programs that have already been in place. Uh, and we're going to see constant updates on these uh, over the next six months. Many of them are coming to fruition 
um, in this next quarter and next quarter or two. So system hardening, um, making uh, their infrastructure uh, much more uh, impervious to uh, weather conditions and forest um, and, you know, and starting forest fires. Enhanced vegetation management, uh, inspections um, and situational awareness, which is essentially 400 weather stations and camera monitoring system throughout their network. As they roll this out, there's going to be constant updates about what's going on uh, and more comfort from the market um, that they have their house in an order and that the operational efficiency uh, of the company has, has dramatically improved from what it was a few years ago. Uh, the results on the same day is uh, Ed's company Sanson out on the 25th. So we'll get more, com uh, more clarity around these programs and the CapEx spend then. Um, and then the third and sort of final factor is the stocks. It's a smaller stock in a sector that I think we're going to see rotation into. So you think about some of the sort of market action that we've been seeing a l uh, over the last quarter or so, we're starting to see larger caps rolling into smaller cap names. Uh, some of these hyper growth companies um, that we've talked about and been involved in have performed very well. They're rolling over, they're rolling over. We're looking at some of the laggards. Again, we can tick the box on this company here. Third point is this is a company full of hard assets. And if we do see a pickup in inflation, the hard assets is something that we want to own. Yes, they will need to renegotiate at some point if the inflation comes through in a big way. But hard asset, old, boring utility business is something I think uh, portfolios should be giving serious consideration to at this point in, town, in, in time. So these three points that, you know, the earnings growth, the catalysts and, and its place in the market um, is a reason why uh, some other Fairly serious investors have been buying into this company as well since uh, since it came out of Chapter 11 in June last year. So David Tepper um, of the big short fame and more recently uh, GameStop, uh, GameStop fame, Howard Marks, Daniel Loeb, Paul Tudor Jones <laughs> have all been buying into this company over the last six months um, with some of them buying sort of four or five percent. In David Tepper's case, uh, at the last filing, it was, uh, it was his... Uh, largest holding. So that provides um, additional comfort that you've got longer term sticky holders, traders, people who see valuation mismatches and opportunities buying into this company. So that's, um, we don't necessarily you know, follow these people in, but if they're there when we are, that's an, it's an added bonus. As for trade structure, again, just like Ed, this is a longer duration play. Um, it has been ticking along at these sorts of prices, 1176 or thereabouts for, for quite a while. And so I would want to look out towards June um, as well. So to get this result on the 25th and the next one. And luckily enough, in our case, um, there is a June contract. Uh, and because volatility has been pretty low, the prices of uh, June $12 calls, which are just fractionally out of the money, uh, are quite reasonable, um, about $1.28. Uh, so I would be tempted to buy these outright. Um, however, there are, again, ways we can try and sort of lower that cost. Um, so even though the February 19th contract is uh, only sort of a week or so away from where we are now, you can probably sell that for sort of 18 to 20 cents. So I'd be inclined to sell that now ahead of the result, um, look for that to ideally expire, um, and lower our cost into those June contracts by um, by around 15%, uh, 18, 20 cents on our $1.28 uh, call price. Then we can make an assessment on what happens with the result. And as Ed said, we can work our way through a program of selling some calls against those long positions that we've got. I'd be inclined to do it in a ratio. So if we've got two calls for the longer dated option, I'd be inclined to sell one because if we see a very strong rally beforehand, I don't want to see that all sort of disappear um, if we've got um, a one for one ratio. So yeah, I think we could look at February. Um, it's a short time frame, but it does drop in before the results. 
Then after the results, we can look at the March and work out through April and May. Um, or if things move along strongly, we can just hold on to those $12 calls. This share price could be uh, you know, in the sort of 15 to up to $20 range as the market comes to the realization that earnings are now stable, uh, the issues of the past have disappeared, and we've got a company that's trading on a very low multiple that's going to see a sector re-rating um, with 10, 15% earnings growth. Mm. That's another really solid idea with lots of detail as well, Anthony. So thanks for that. It's interesting to hear as, you know, it's another kind of variation on growth, as you kind of said at the beginning, a bit of a turnaround story as well as in there. And I thought it was really interesting that you mentioned uh, the sort of hard assets protecting against inflation going forward. And I think um, perhaps that brings us to another question, um, which is kind of your, your current sort of market outlook. Um, to, to, to either of you guys. You both mentioned long ideas this episode. So is that representative of your view as a whole? I mean, let you kick that off, Ed. Yeah, I mean, you know, we can keep looking at charts. You know, in the last couple of uh, What's On Your Mind, we've been talking about the frothing. That's, you can look at charts of institutional cash levels, which are now at all-time lows. You can look at market breadth, which is back down again. Uh, you can look at all these things that to old shags like us are sort of flashing warning signs that things are potentially getting overextended. Now, just because institutionals are, are, are fully invested and they don't have much cash doesn't mean that they're going to be a seller of equities if the stock goes down, if the market falls 5% on a bad headline. So I'm a reluctant participator of the current market. I don't have a long bias. I don't have a short bias. I'm just trying to keep trading, diversify long short equity option portfolios. Now, in my mind, I'm looking for signs that sentiment changes, and then I can adjust the skew, the bias of my book quite quickly with a couple of put structures. But I'm trying to stay fresh from the mindset of we're about to go lower, we're about to fall. It could happen on any given day. It could happen in six months or not at all. So. There appears to be an appetite for equities. Valuations have been rich for a while. They can get richer. So I think the most important thing is just to stay very disciplined. And what that means for me is to stay savvy. Don't get puffed into explosive moves to the upside. If anything, from watching GameStop, you must realize that when a volatility explosion occurs, you cannot trade option strategies because the price you're paying is so very high. So we obviously want to get these positions on in sensible stocks and hope volatility picks up. So I'm mindful of not having any sense of fear of missing out. I'm not chasing things. I'm never going to chase things. That means I have to be more patient. So probably at the moment, I'm trying to stay balanced and I'm probably being more patient. I'm not fighting the market because it seems to want to go up. But increasingly parts of the sort of media led driven stops and the like are just getting too rich whatever that means for me so the nice thing about always developing your watch list even if i'm not actively trading some good stocks that i think i will wait for a, a pullback is i'm constantly thinking i like this stock i might think about putting the structure on at this level so my work arena is full of limits where I want to sell things or I want to buy things, but they're not there yet. And I just feel that that's the right way for me to trade this. So discipline. I do not want to lose my shape. I don't want to end up getting longer unless the macro really changes more positively. So reluctant. When I say reluctant participator, I'm happy just to swim with the market, but I'm not taking a long or short bias i'm just trying to find stocks like sanderson that make sense and it's really just a function of maintaining balance as well ed that we yeah. you, you could find yourself getting dragged into some of these hyper growth names that have performed incredibly well and next thing you know you're got a huge skew there and we see a little down tick in uh, you've got things blowing up left, right and centre. Uh, there's 3,000 companies out there that are sort of $2 billion market cap or more. There's a lot of little 
sectors and, and areas of the market that are you know, not on people's radars um, in, a, in a big way at the moment. And I think you know, we've just provided sort of you know, two perfectly good examples of that. Um, so that remains sort of my focus as well. That there's, we've said it for you know, a year now that you know, we've seen sort of unprecedented moves in certain things. And one of them has been um, the massive outperformance of the heavily shorted stocks. Um, Goldman does a basket of the most heavily shorted stocks and it's uh, been a huge outperformer uh, in recent uh, in the recent year. Uh, but if you have a look at this chart here, you can see that in aberration, you know, since 1985. So we're going back to back to about when you and I were uh, in <laughs> short pants, Ed. Um, and the most heavily shorted stocks have been, you know, massive underperformance. This really is an aberration at the moment, and I suspect it's, it's not going to continue for the long term. And I guess to your point as well, you know, we're trying to, you know, look for signs and indications of what, um, you know, market sentiment um, and then what's going on with the underlying economy as well. And so we've had lots of talk about inflation. We've talked about the steepening yield curves and signs of inflation there and that the Fed is still just, you know, going to be a long way away from, from doing anything. Um, but we're starting to see little ticks in economic numbers coming through. Uh, so I just wanted to show this chart here as well. Uh, which is U.S. inflation, um, which is uh, the blue line, and then the black line is ISM. But it's ISM prices paid, and this is just real numbers flowing through um, people's businesses, and it's shown a huge tick up, and it's not reflected yet in uh, the broader inflation numbers. And so a little tick up in the broader inflation number may be something that does lead to a tick down in the market. Um, but like you, that tick down could come from a level that's 15 or 20 percent higher in six months' time, or it could come next week. Um, and it, uh, it's, it's a function of just being not overextended and, and being sort of as nimble as you can at the moment. Yeah. And sometimes, just the last thing I'll say is, you know, we know, for example, you can take a segment of the market, you can look at bad debts, whether that's uh, corporate or consumer. But if you think of consumer, bad debts are very, very low, and that's because the Fed government hasn't allowed bad debts to come through because it's still looking after its people and sending out checks. Now, at some point, when this stops, bad debts are going to explode. People are very over indebted. So is it time to put on a trade in something like Encore Capital, a nice little debt collection company in the States? Absolutely not. But it's on the radar. This is what I'm talking about in my workspace and how I'm sort of thinking, is I just need to follow the data. And so when I start to see that the people are starting to really struggle and the checks are stopping, and now we're going to deal with higher structural unemployment at the lower middle end of the economy, then that's a company that's going to pop up on the radar. So whilst we could talk for hours about is the market going up or is the market going down, it's sometimes, you know, don't forget to spend time thinking, what am I going to trade if this happens? Don't worry about when it will happen. Just worry about what you're going to do if it happens. Then you can be prepared. And then when the data starts to show up, you're straight in and you're getting the right trades on your book. So yeah, that's really it. It's uh it is what it is. Stay disciplined, stay savvy, wouldn't you agree, Anthony? I would indeed. And as the great Chris Cathy would say, he you know, we want to trade what is probable and not what is possible. So we don't want to get it too far out on those margins. <laughs> Cool. Great stuff, guys. Uh, we'll finish up there. Uh, thanks both for coming on the show, sharing your ideas today. Loads to unpack, loads of detail in both your ideas. I thought they were both really interesting, thought-provoking uh, ideas and you explained them well. So I'm, I'm sure our viewers appreciated those as I did too. Uh, speaking of our viewers, I always like to close the show to let you guys know what's going on at uh, ITPM, any news and events that we've got coming up. Uh, last week on the last episode of What's On Your Mind, I mentioned uh, the big one coming up, which is our War Rooms Live Trader Mentoring event, which starts on March 18th and runs for 10 trading days. 
essentially all the mentors that you see on what's on your mind here will be uh, involved in that event and uh, they'll be talking you through their perspectives on markets on a live basis for those 10 trading days in a webinar format uh, that uh, runs each each day before the US open of markets um, but that's it for this week on what's on your mind I hope you guys manage to join us next time and uh, thanks very much for watching